Uh, did you catch that? Uh, Lamar stated his views on police brutality with that line in the song, quote, and we hate the popo, want to kill us in the street, fo show. KG. Ah, <laughs> oh, please. Ugh, <laughs> oh, I don't like it. <laughs> I mean, you know I don't like it. That's why you came to me. I get it. That's his right to express himself. Let the free market decide. Pers I guess I'm jaded to feel as if the news really isn't ever created for me to hear my side. I mean, it's, we've seen a lot of um, the demonization of, of African-American men, um, of black communities. You know, there's, a, there's an age old saying in journalism, if it bleeds, it leads. A lot of this perpetuating of the idea that there is only high crime there, um, not necessarily looking at the, the causes for higher crime rates or, or murder rates. It still seems to be the same things, you know, it's, it seems to be, oh, there's crime here, there's drugs here, these people are scary. And oftentimes violence plays out in inner cities, low income neighborhoods. And in that, if you are to cover violent stories, shootings, stabbings, robberies, et cetera, in low-income communities, and it is the first thing that somebody sees at a newscast at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock, a perception among your audience is instilled within their mind frame and how they think about these people. And that is, I think, a general problem with a... 24 hour news cycle that's based in kind of grabbing attention. And once you understand that, that we're not broadcasting to just white people, Spanish people, Asian people, black people, we're reporting to the world and the world is all different creeds and colors. And it's our job to make sure that we represent our stories. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take back the there moderator's are, I don't role think there and, are I want, any. and I wanna get to another subject which is the issue of protests in many cities that have turned violent. I wonder what goes through the minds of the protesters who have been out there all day long trying to make a legitimate point, trying to call attention to something so important. And now to see all the attention diverted to what we're looking at now, as we appear to be looking at a store uh, being broken into and looted right now. That's a live picture you're looking at. Austin businesses were left in ruins, windows smashed out, fires were set in some areas, and stores were looted. Of course, these are businesses who are hanging on for dear life because of the pandemic. So this is the last thing they needed. WBC. Hi, Erica. It's really a uh, cleanup and a preparation. You know, it's a beautiful day down here on Newbury Street, but the evidence of the ugliness is everywhere. These guys... Yeah, like I said, they, they all seem to feel a little bit different. Uh, indistinct for me to see these voices rallied together um was empowering there's a there's a pretty wide range of emotion uh present just like being with so many like-minded people um who are all fighting to see the same changes take uh take place in our country there's a lot of jubilance, there's a lot of excitement and happiness and righteousness amongst the protesters. They are happy about the hope for possible change, jubilance and, and joyful when they see other people coming out in growing numbers to support these causes, especially in a city like Boston where I'm seeing widespread diversity that it wasn't just you know black people marching for for black lives or black causes it was um everyone marching and realizing that what happened with george floyd brianna taylor ahmaud aubrey um the list can go on sandra bland what happened to them people um needs needed to be addressed it's interesting that they can like judge our entire movement by like the worst actions I don't think I've seen much coverage that I, I was like, oh yeah, cool. Like they really captured what's going on. And yeah, it's just been kind of a calling card now for black people is equal to violence. You know, if you're supporting black people, you're supporting violence.
if you're supporting back the blue, you're supporting the good cops, you know, and um, I think there has to be a divorce of that idea, but it's so hard to do that when innately um, every news source has done such a great job of tying black people to violence. Like there are so many occasions where it's like people playing music or, or dancing or sharing information and all this other stuff. And like a very, very small percentage, at least in Boston um, or especially in Boston, um, has been rioting and looting. So yes, there, there are violent issues that have, that have happened because of these protests. Yes, you know, no, we can deny that. But the bigger picture is there have been more nonviolent demonstrations than anything. And that also needs to be told as well. I mean, does, there, does the media have a role to play? Um, um, yes and no. I mean, we are required to tell what's happening. But we're also required to tell what's not happening as well. But I think like what we have, what we have to be really careful about in my eyes is again, like distinguishing. Cause I'm always like, like I feel like the organizers are very clear a lot of times too. And they're like, the protest ends at this time. So I'm like, from journalistically, I almost feel like there should be a shift after that time about what, how you're talking about this protest and being careful to explain whether or not what happened after that was part of the protest or maybe it was just something that happened as a result. In LA specifically, I've noticed um, and I've seen from being uh, boots on the ground out here that news um, trucks will drive away if there's not anything quote unquote like spicy happening. Um, so if there's not violence, if there's not unrest, if there's not disruption or conflict, um, then there won't be coverage. Um, so the fact that the news is basically chasing violence, trying to um, break a story on Black oppression, it kind of just can perpetuates that because that's um, viewed as what people want to see and what people want to learn about. There needs to be more of a of focus on why the, the, these things are happened in context with what happened, you know? So I think when a news photographer goes out, whether they're black or white, they're trying to get that snap. That's something that kind of you can look at and either be uh, amazed by, uh, uh, terrified of, or latched on to in some type of emotional way. Um, and I think that is to the detriment of a lot of people, uh, but mostly people of color. They were not taught to, either they weren't taught, they don't care, or whoever they're working for doesn't care about getting those other moments. They just want, you know, that central moment, or they just want the front of the march, or they only want when the, there's clashing happening. And, you know, the clashing happening is just as important as like the mom with her three kids that are at the rally because the mom wants to show those three kids this is correct. You know, that moment's just as important. And I feel like, I've seen more of like the official press not get those moments. Um, the fact that people need to see uh, black people wounded or harmed or being abused in order to believe and act on it in protection and defense of them is an extremely cyclical um, issue that's happening within this country. If you're talking about maybe like a CNN like, I don't think there's like a whole lot of nuance that happens when you have five people necessarily, when, when there's no storytelling. I think nuance really comes out of storytelling. Um, and that, that's not the only way it comes out, but I think that's one of the best ways because you have a better way to illustrate what's going on. But oh, I think it's easy for someone to look now at Black Lives Matter and say, you know, it's all about defunding police. It's all about abolishing the police. But I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure certain that that's not the ideology of everyone who is out there protesting. I feel like we're in this time where it's really important to go a little bit further below the headlines in terms of 
I think the headlines can be kind of jarring at times and kind of simplistic. And I think that there's a lot of complexity happening in our society. Um, so it would be a harder push to present um, educational stories featuring what these organizations organizations are about and what their demands actually are or uplifting stories about community organizations that have been working within the community for decades consistently providing resources. I, that's why I appreciate you know like the emergence of all of these African-American photographers who are covering the protests because then you sort of get another um, you get another perspective and you get like a more honest lens. And I see um, those who are there just to document and be part of the movement find those moments. I would say as a photographer, um, when you have a camera, when you're holding something and analyzing something, you cannot be without putting yourself. Journalistically, you know, I think, you know, ethically, I can't, I can't pronounce my views. I think that my, what I've chosen to focus on is evident in who I am, you know. Um, but I don't, I think the politicization of Black Lives Matter is, is very misguided. I think that, you know, in essence, this is a human rights issue that, um, and it's not a political issue. Um, I don't know if you, if you know it, Gabby, but um, I'm a Black male. <laughs> and so, yes, I am a journalist. I, I am a, I'm a reporter. Yes, I do report the facts as it is. I, tr I do be, I am fair and balanced, but this one was different. As a Black man, it's incredibly important that I be involved in these types of stories because they impact me and people who look like me firsthand. In the majority of these cases where police are accused of misconduct. It's a black man who is the victim or the subject of these episodes. And as a black man, I take a vested interest in covering these stories um, with passion, uh, with empathy, uh, and with integrity. I mean, it's been really important for me to, to, to sort of claim that cultural authority too in my own work and be, um, you know, to really speak up when I'm thinking that we are not necessarily not doing something right, but maybe there's something that we haven't considered as part of our coverage. And I think people have been really receptive to that. And I think as a photographer of color, my upbringing, like my ideas are all based in my uh, upbringing. And that's what I think makes me feel uniquely capable um, to be in these moments, getting these images. And I think the, the way that this industry is telling these stories, I think is, like I said, a breath of fresh air. Is there room for improvement? Yes, of course. But the fact that we are actually taking these steps and the world is seeing what's really been happening this entire time speak volumes and i say that with full knowledge that as a white person i do not know what it's like to be a person of color or a black person now having said that you know i don't think i think part of the gig is that you should be able to um be parachuted into any situation and it's not to say there aren't capable uh photographers of of uh, uh what that that are that are non-black um to speak to this uh but you have to always be aware of your blind spots don't just promote the idea of five people were shot police are still looking for the shooter this is now the 10th shooting in two months these are all facts that are relevant to the story but beyond those statistics are people who are really hurting who are innocent to any of the wrongdoings that may have taken place. And let's not forget about them, just in our efforts to portray this violence that is playing out. Um, so an example uh, to say Jane Doe um, was raped at, on Tuesday, 
instead of John Doe raped Jane on Tuesday. Um, so you see like the, you don't know that John Doe is a part of the story when you frame it in that way. And that tends to happen a lot um, in media, whether it be social media or news media. Um, instead of uh, stories on how the police and protesters are clashing, the ideology or the psychology of some of the activists or the protesters in this area are thinking of themselves as us versus the police instead of us uplifting and supporting Black lives. Is to uh, stay in contact with, you know, folk like me, like other organizers or people that you see that are, are trying to benefit the community in many different ways because like, yeah, these protests are cool, but like there's so many other things that we could be and need to be doing. When I'm covering these protests, um, getting voices of color into the paper that are at the demonstrations is essential part of my coverage. And that is definitely something that I'm extremely cognizant of. And I try not to value one's perspective over another, but in the case of Breonna Taylor, the voice of black women is more important than others. Because this is a story that involved a black woman who by no wrongdoing of her own, lost her life. So I think we should hear from black women in a case that involves one who lost her life. I don't want it to be a bunch of white people, you know, quoted in the Boston Globe, talking about uh, racial inequities. But I think it comes down to the fact that like, we don't, we can't control everything, you know, and that's not where the energy should be put. You know, I mean, I think that a message, you know, I think that that like trying to control the aspects of how other people perceive it is like me trying to control the aspects of how somebody else perceives me all the time. Like it's just futile. And people going out and getting the story, you know, I can't, I can't stop that bad reporter. I can't stop that photographer who's going to step in front of my shot. I can't stop that guy who's um, going in there with a certain perspective. Um, but what we can do or what I have the power to do is counter that narrative. It was a huge, uh, huge, huge honor, you know, to tell these stories of people who have been silent for years. Um, Dr. King says um, protest is the language of those unheard. In the newsroom, you don't want to seem as the angry black man. You don't want to see as the angry black woman. And so a lot of times we were silent in, in our story pitching. You know, we were pitch stories that affect the black and brown communities. And oh no, that's not a story or, you know, that's not, that's not important. And so we were silent up until recently. We were silent up until actually, I believe this year. We have been turning to the voices in our newsroom who do have, who are black, right? And who do have kind of that cultural understanding and that cultural authority, even though they may not be an editor, so to speak. It's funny, it, it's, it's 100% a generational thing. And I think most people our age um, want to see everything get better and they want equality and they want everything to, they want everyone to feel like they are necessary. The older generation I feel like is ingrained and it, it's not their fault. It's what they grew up in. It's a system that's been in place for ever. And it's hard for, those people to change, except that, you know, we can't get into those positions because they're not leaving those positions. And it's, it, yeah, it's just this perpetual system that just wants to keep circulating over and over. There's, it's not really diversity or inclusion if your all white newsroom is hiring or is deciding which marginalized uh, people will do work with them, right? Like there needs to be, there needs to be women and, and people of color uh, on the boards of all of these publications. Just like everyone making decisions. It, it, if, I don't know what the exact uh, percentage is, but I, I can guarantee that America as a country 
the United States as a country is not 85% white men, right? Like all of these companies should be representative of the population, um, as, as diverse as the population.